Hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Mukuhe from uh, Food Bank in Kenya. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you GFN for giving us such an opportunity to come and uh, share our different experiences and also learn from uh, one another. And uh, now without further ado, I'll go to my uh, my presentation. Our presentation uh, was on uh, rescuing surplus from commercial farms in Kenya. And uh, agriculture is uh, actually the backbone of Kenyan economy. About 75% of Kenya Kenyans get their income from uh, agricultural sector. And 33% uh, actually 65% of our GDP is generated from agriculture. So agriculture is a very key sector in, in our country. And uh, both uh, the commercial farmers or uh, large scale farming and small scale farming run concurrently. But uh, today we are focusing on uh, commercial farms, which uh, is also large scale farming. Um, food insecurity is heightened and uh, like I mentioned, uh, they run concurrently, the small scale and small scale farming and uh, large scale farming. So I'll uh, go to slide two of my presentation. Okay, most large scale farmers in Kenya are mainly involved in horticulture. The, far, the commercial farms that we've been working with mostly uh, deal with horticultural farming. We also have uh, cash crops farming being done by large, uh, the commercial farmers and livestock farming. Though mainly we've been uh, doing a lot of uh, fruit and vegetables, that is what we've been getting from the farmers. This uh, sector, the horticulture, it has a lot of potential to FBK, that is Food Bank in Kenya, because we realize that uh, there is a lot of waste, a lot of post harvest losses occur in this sector. Uh, this uh, comprises mainly on the production of fruits, vegetables, and flowers. The average annual growth rate of 20% in the subsector underscores the demand for Kenya's high quality produce in the world markets. Um, most uh, commercial farmers that we are working with, they use high technology and therefore they produce high value crops. Most of these uh, crops or fresh farm produce are mainly for export. And uh, most of it is exported to the European Union. So this sector actually employs uh, around 2 million people and accounts up to 21% of all our agricultural export. Now, food wastage. Um, this is one of, uh, agriculture recovery is one of the program that we started uh, the last, in the last uh, two months. We initially, we were, we were giving um, the vulnerable or our beneficiary the dry foods, but uh, we realized that Kenya is very strong on agriculture. And uh, we visited some farms, we did uh, some survey, and we realized that there was, there was so much food wastage happening, happening at these uh, uh, fresh farm producer uh, farms. These farms um, all over the country, but at the moment we are really concentrating on uh, the Lift Valley and uh, mainly a place called uh, Nakuru County, which is not very far from Nairobi because of logistics. And uh, also we were looking at the concentration of these farms. There are so many, we have uh, only been able to work with a few, but uh, there is a, uh, there is, uh, a lot of um, positive response coming from these uh, from this sector. 
So the losses that are recorded from, by these farmers, mostly we realize that they happen at uh, production, post-harvest handling, and agro-processing. So we, we asked ourselves, why? Why, all, why do post-harvest losses, why, why all this wastage? And uh, when we were doing the survey, we realized that there are some factors that have been uh, causing these uh, surplus. And most of them are lack of access to markets. For example, during, uh, now, uh, during this period, the pandemic uh, or COVID-19 uh, period, we realized that uh, there were a lot of uh, losses because of lack of access to market. There were a lot of restrictions and uh, most of the farmers uh, had so much in terms of surplus. The other reason is uh, the cosmetic preferences that lead to export rejects. At the export, especially in our park house, which are mainly found in our airports, we have a lot of rejects. But uh, these rejects are, are farm fresh produce mainly that are uh, fit for human consumption. In fact, most of it uh, that we have uh, been getting, it's actually very fresh and very good uh, uh, because we've been taking it directly to uh, the vulnerable, the groups that we've been serving in, um, in our network. The other reason was decreased external demand, the export. Um, I mentioned uh, when I, st I started that uh, uh, Kenya does a lot of uh, horticultural exports and mainly to the European Union. But uh, we've been having some, uh, some uh, impact due to, uh, for example, the climate changes and also the, the COVID-19, which has uh, made the demand, uh, the demand very minimal. So we've been uh, getting uh, a lot of losses from this area because of this factor. The other factor is excess production by farmers, which makes the market flood. We call it bumper harvest. And uh, this mainly happened uh, to uh, the produce that are mainly seasonal. Uh, I remember we visited a farm that had uh, a lot of uh, pumpkins. And uh, there were pumpkins all over. They had flooded the market. So this is another reason why we've been getting uh, this surplus. And also uh, food uh, is lost because of poor storage for very highly perishable products. I've mentioned uh, that uh, most of these commercial farmers handle uh, vegetables and uh, we all know that vegetables are highly perishable. And so this is another reason uh, why we have uh, a lot of food uh, being wasted. And another one is deflated prices. When the prices fall down, then uh, it, is, uh, it doesn't really work for the farmers and uh, hence a reason for for the surplus. And uh, where does uh, Food Bank in Kenya come in? After we did our survey, we did our research, we went and uh, mapped most of these farms. We created a database and uh, we realized that a big concentration is in this area that we are mostly putting our focus on. So we identified uh, where the losses occur and uh, where we can be able to rescue more fresh farm pro, uh, from the farms. Then um, we rescue export rejects that could have gone to waste or uh, we buy at subsidized prices. The, rest, the rejects, we've been getting them mainly at the airports. Uh, even in the farms, sometimes we've been purchasing, we've been buying at some uh, subsidized prices. This is uh, to strengthen our partnership. We, depending on um, the nature of our partnership, there are some that uh, we are forced to, to, to pay just um, very minimal prices. It's very subsidized, but uh, we've also been getting other surplus for free, but at times we buy at subsidized rates.
Uh, we also re we now dis redistribute this salvaged food to the vulnerable community. We when we, we visited the farm, some one farm uh, in Nakuru, we realized that uh, it was um, almost every farm had a had a landfill, and most of these surplus were. Go it was very unfortunate that when uh, they have a lot of surplus, they normally take it. It end up in uh, landfills. Whereas uh, we have so many people who are sleeping, hungry, we have vulnerable, who would really consume and appreciate this kind of um, produce. Now, how do these farms benefit? This is a conversation that uh, we normally have uh, when uh, we are discussing our partnerships with uh, these uh, commercial farms. Because uh, we clear the product to make room for their next planting season. Because at times we are given produce in the farms. They want to clear for the next season. So we, we work with volunteers who will help and uh, just clear the product so that they can uh, prepare their farms for the next planting season. So this is a benefit to them. We also save their monetary losses by purchasing the product at subsidized rates. That is in the scenario where we buy at uh, the rates that I had just explained earlier. We also promote their businesses and image by acknowledging their activities. We work very closely with these firms. We acknowledge them in our activities and uh, sometimes through our publicity channels when uh, we have activities, our social media platforms. So this is a very, it's a benefit for them because it enables these farms to have or make it like their corporate social responsibility. And uh, so they are seen uh, to be a good uh, corporate citizens. So that's a big benefit to the farms and uh, most of them are really responding very well. And uh, our partnership has been growing so now our plans for agriculture recovery, because uh, these are very young program. It's a very young program, but uh, it has a great future considering that uh, this is where our strength is. Yes, we are also uh, looking at the small scale farmers for some product like fruits. Most of the seasonal fruits we get from small scale farmers, but the biggest potential is at the, the commercial farms because uh, if, uh, we are able to increase our capacity because at the moment we are not able to actually take um, a lot because of the capacity. So our plan for the future it is to increase our capacity that is cold storage because uh, we are getting uh, some um, produce that are very perishable. In fact, we are forced to, to distribute these uh, produce mostly in fact, immediately. When we receive them from the farms, we, we have um, a good uh, communication network with our, uh, the vulnerable that we've been working with. We have a team of um, beneficiaries. So most of them, in fact, uh, collect their surplus this very same day. Because Naivasha is not very far. It is like uh, 60 kilometers, kilometers from Nairobi. So it takes like uh, close to one to one, to two hours and uh, the produce is in uh, our warehouse. And so the beneficiaries, mostly because uh, the need is too huge. So they are always uh, waiting. So it's rarely to get, um, to get uh, food that is uh, just uh, uh, at the warehouse waiting to be collected. And another thing that we want to do is lobby for a legal framework that would put in place intervention to encourage farmers to be able to donate their surplus and hence bring significant uh, reduction to post-harvest losses. This one uh, is because uh, we're looking at uh, a framework that we would encourage also tax rebate to such farmers, especially in uh, buying farm inputs like fertilizer and other inputs. So we are also planning to increase our collaboration with partners. More, that is more partners in the agricultural sector. That is the government, 
uh, the government, uh, we have um, other players, key players in the sector. Uh, we also creating more surplus to, and we also creating awareness to encourage farmers and growers, food processor and other supply chain to partner with FPK in this program. And I thank you very much uh, for the session. Thank you for listening. Susan, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. So if anyone has questions, please raise your hand or, or speak up. And if you end your screen share, we can see. Um, so, anyway, so any questions? Andy, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask Susan, um, how many farmers do you have in your network? Um, what's the distances that you have to travel? And how frequent do you make those kind of uh, dist uh, uh, trips to be able to go collect those surpluses and what kind of volumes are we talking about? Uh, thank you very much, Andy, for your question. And uh, if I got you right, uh, you wanted to know how many uh, like trips we are able to make. Like I've mentioned, this is still a young uh, program. And uh, we've been uh, collecting, okay, in, uh, we have, uh, like now we are doing like three big farms. That is commercial farms in uh, Naivasha. So we collect like almost daily, almost daily. And uh, every day we do like um, three tons, three tons of fresh farm produce. But we are also getting some, um, there are some uh, fresh farm produce from uh, some farmers near that are not very far from where we are. But those ones are not large, they're not commercial farmers. And uh, mostly what we've been getting from them, those are fruits and some vegetables. So in uh, the commercial farms, we go like, uh, okay, we, we, we make like four trips or five in a week. Because Sundays, we do, they don't operate. They don't operate on Sundays. So in the commercial farms, we do like five in a week or four. Yes. So mainly, we, rely, we also rely on the small scale farming, which is closer to Nairobi, because that one is very easy. They even bring to us. And also the airport. These are the rejects. Because the airport is within where our facility is. I hope I have answered your question, Andy. Thank you. And um, so, a question there for Madagascar as well, Blondine. Did you see your hand raised? Hello, everybody. And uh, many thanks to Suzanne for her presentation. Very clear. And I would just like to know uh, how you have solved this energy uh, problem because you are working on fresh products. Uh, how do you um, maintain them before distributing? And we also uh, would like to know who are your, what is your target? Because you have not spoken about your beneficiaries, who are them and how do you select them? And uh, at the end, we would like to to have the same uh, project in the urban area. So if you can share with us your presentation, it can help us. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Okay, thank you very much, Benedine, for your question. And uh, if I got you correct, you wanted uh, to know how we, we are able uh, uh, to, okay, to collect these uh, fresh farm produce and ensure that uh, we are able to give uh, 
the same uh, when it's still uh, fit for human consumption. What we do, because uh, I mentioned that we do not have adequate capacity. So what we do, we have a, a database of uh, beneficiaries. And these beneficiaries, we've been serving um, people in organized, we are working mainly with organized groups. We have a network of uh, orphanages. We have uh, centers for the elderly or probably people with uh, physical uh, disability. So these organized groups mainly, we, we have a, a network and we have a, a very good communication network. We call them, we have a, a WhatsApp group. So we call them, we tell because uh, we, know, we, we normally have a schedule. We know who got what and at what time. So if this team, because we have Nairobi, we have divided Nairobi in zones. This time, for example, in the, on a Tuesday, we will visit, we will give a beneficiary from these, uh, we call them sub-county. This sub-county, the next, week, the next uh, probably on Wednesday, we give an, uh, people from other, so we know exactly who is supposed to get what food and at what time. So this is how we've been uh, working. And um, the target, those are the, 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 you mentioned about the targets, I think I've answered the people that we serve, but at some point, because like uh, uh, in instances when there is so much need, we go also to informal settlement, but mainly we are working with organized groups because uh, we realized that it was very easy to serve people who are in such a setup. Thank you so much. One question, Susan. Yeah, I will I'll also share the-, the I, I also have a share. question. Okay. Yes. Can I? Uh, my yes, please. Yeah, Susan, how often do you buy the surplus of rejects? And uh, how many times do you, do you redistribute it to, the, to your beneficiary? Okay. We really- Okay, we buy, very, we don't buy, we buy very minimal, like the rejects mainly, we, we are usually given. Where we are making um, purchases at subsidized rates are mainly at the farms. But the rejects, they don't sell, they give us for free. But uh, at the farm sometimes, because we are, we are given some surplus that, um, uh, that are, not, not, not actually, they don't have any defects, they are very okay. Uh, just as a form of uh, motivating these uh, partners, because we call them partners, the, the farmers. So that is uh, when we buy, or sometimes when uh, there is um, need, we don't have food in the warehouse, and we know there is um, uh, a team that is supposed to collect food, so sometimes we go out, and that is when we negotiate for those uh, subsidized prices, just to ensure that we don't leave um, a, a, a group out. Okay, thank you. We'll change one final question on this one, and then we'll switch over to the next, uh, to the next presentation, which will be from Madagascar. So Michael, do you want to ask your question? And then we'll move on to the next part. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, um, and thank you very much, Susan, for the presentation. So my um, question just centers around um, the fact that, you know, essentially from what I can get from the presentation, you get most of this, they are mostly fresh, um, fresh produce. And from our own experience of dealing with fresh produce and all of that, it's you know, puts a whole lot of pressure on you to do distribution that, that day or the following day so they don't go to waste and we are not um, those that also encourage food waste. So how to how are you able to manage, you know, the pressure that comes with distribution of, um, of, of this fresh produce and um, what is your volunteer strength? And also the beneficiaries, these organized groups, do you deliver to them or they pick up from you? You know, so all this, um, we, are, we want to just have an understanding of because really on our own part, um, you know, we, we, we are looking at how we can increase our, um, um, you know, donation of fresh produce and, and all of that. And we are looking at these challenges and the pressure that comes with it. So 
you can advise in that regard. Thank you. Okay, Michael. Michael, thank you. Uh, I totally agree with you that this is uh, an area that uh, has a lot of pressure, especially uh, because, uh, like I mentioned, the, these uh, produce are very perishable. So that is what we have done. I've said when we were doing research, we took an area that is not far from where we are. And uh, this is because uh, we don't have adequate capacity. So when we get the produce, we ensure that before even the produce come, we have communicated to the people who are supposed to get their rations. And uh, at some time, uh, okay, there are some times when we are forced to deliver, but we don't deliver to, to, the, uh, to, to everyone. We go to a central place, for example, uh, there is a, we have identified some key areas, we, like smaller temporary depots, where they can come for, for and um, uh, it's usually where we, it's usually easy for them. But um, right now, we don't have a lot of uh, issue because mainly they are coming to our facility and uh, or uh, the depots wherever we are. But uh, I agree with you, it is usually very challenging. We've also been having some time when uh, we are forced, sometimes we take to them because we don't want that fresh produce to remain in the warehouse. So we have to deliver at some point, but at depots, not where they are. Just we take the produce closer to them. But there are some, mostly they are now coming. So it has eased our burden. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation, Susan, and thank you for all the good questions there. A reminder, after all three presentations, you'll go into smaller groups and an opportunity to discuss this in your groups. And I think we have enough people from Kenya that you will have somebody from Kenya in your breakout group, whichever group you're in. So, again, thank you. And let's move on to the presentation from Madagascar. Uh, switching more now to smallholder farmers, as Kenya said, their focus is really the commercial farms. Madagascar have worked a lot with smallholder farms. So we'll switch over there and this will be 20 minutes for presentation and Q&A. So Blondine and Asia, over to you. Sorry. Okay. So, hello everyone. I'm Yeza Anavneri, and I will be presenting the Madagascar Food Bank with my colleague uh, Blandi Legonu. We both work for World Food Program in Madagascar, and we are members of the board of executives of the Madagascar Food Bank. So, first of all. We want to thank the GFN to let us uh, make this opportunity. And um, our, presentation, our presentation, sorry, will try to give you the context, the mission and objectives of the Madagascar Food Bank, as well as cover the management strategy and committee, and uh, what are the links with small other farmers organization. So nearly 2 million of Malagasy people find themselves in a situation of food insecurity. And out of this, around 450,000 people are faced with severe food insecurity. Uh, Madagascar is ranked 116th out of 119 countries related to the Global hun Hunger Index. And the study on zero hunger has recommended the setting up of food banks. And this led the BNGRC, or the Risk and Disaster Management National Office, the Lions Club International District 417, and Madagascar World Food Program to set up the Madagascar Food Bank. So, Asia? the Madagascar Food Sorry, sorry? Can, you, can you enter presentation mode? 
um, just to make the screen so that we can all see the full slide. A little box on the bottom, remember, with the, the box on the stick. Sorry, this? Which one? If you go to the bottom of the of your PowerPoint screen, yeah, right, and um, right next to the the bar that slides to zoom, there's a little box on a stick. If you just click on that, I don't see what you say. Oh, sorry. This like this? Yes, like that. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. But so, but no. Uh, just one one minute. But sorry. Ah la 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 la. No. Oh. Ça va aller, tu crois? Because with the full screen, I didn't see my notes, so <laughs> I have some problems to. So Madagascar for Bronc is a non-profit organization, and um, till now we fed uh, 500,000 households at risk of hunger in the south of Madagascar, and uh, particularly in, in Antananarive with the pandemic 19 COVID. Uh, COVID. So last year we distributed the equivalent of uh, 15 metric tons of meals to kids, seniors and families in need. Now, our mission is focused on challenging poverty, uh, meeting needs, so provide emergency food to save lives, deliver affordable and sustainable community-led solution to local problems. And uh, we try to transform lives, so we, uh, we count on research and develop new ideas to encouraging and supporting people out of poverty and the exclusion. So what are our main objectives? Our main objective is to involve individuals and legal entities in voluntary action, creating needs to help the spirit of solidarity among, among Malagasy people, and ensuring food security by reducing food waste in southern of Madagascar. So our um, main objective is to collect, manage, and share food to people in need and make it available to the community in an effective and sustainable way. So how the food banks work? We received the, the food from uh, the food, the grocery industries and the other private sector or NGOs or other organization. Food are stored in our food store and we donate this food, we redistribute this food to beneficiaries and uh, in, um, in schools. And uh, our highlights, yeah. we just want to highlight some uh, very great moments in the life of our food bank, like November 2019, we have inaugur inaugurated the, the food bank. Oh. And when uh, COVID-19 appears, we also distributed uh, food uh, for about 2,600 mm -hmm. people. And now we are moving on partnership, uh, in partnership with Sodexo, uh, the private sector, uh, to work with uh, smallholder farmers, buy from them, and then distribute to the most vulnerable people and to a school contains also. So our um, management strategy is uh, to have food from small other farmers with a surplus production, food stocks for uh, 2,000 2, people for more than three months now. And we have a management committee at the community level the three partners, that means uh, WFP, BNGRC, and the Lions Club, are a supra communal structure who supervise 
the community uh, uh, committee, and the bank is open to, to capital inflows with a startup token between 10 and 15 tons, metric tons. Um, the bank is open twice a week, and the eligible products to be stores are cereals, fuels, processed foods like curry and cactus, and tubers, and tubers, sorry. And the pilot phase of Tananda will allow to see trends and make adjustments. So we are now thinking about the, the way to replicate Tananda here in uh, Antananarive in the suburban area. So this pilot will allow us to see how make the, the adjustment and how to replicate uh, normally this, uh, this new uh, store in uh, Antananarive. So like, uh, like main uh, food bank, we've got uh, in the management committee, the president, secretary, and uh, so on. But uh, the guardian of the food bank are paid by the community. And there is the existence of, of um, complaint and reconciliation committee in the food bank. Madagascar um, strategy and ambition is to link uh, Madagascar food bank with small holder farmers because WFP have a small holder farmers access to market program. And as WFP is a member of a Madagascar Food Bank, we are making this link. So who are these small holder farmers? They are usually in traditional small family farms of less than one hectare with very low productivity and because they use a manual equipment, very uh, mm, raw mat materials, and no inputs and no fertilizer. They do not do intensive uh, production. And uh, the main production, the main part of the production is consumed by the families, uh, by the households. And uh, the main crops they are cultivating are rice, corn, corn, beans, cassava, and other tubers like a sweet potatoes or taro. And the challenges they are facing is a, obviously this low productivity, the climate shocks and risks because in the southern region of Madagascar is very, very, very dry. So droughtness is the, a big challenge. Insecurity also is a big challenge because once they produce uh, or, or the cattle uh, is robbed by these uh, thieves in the, the, in the community. Competition with imported products is also a challenge because it's cheaper than what they are producing and what they are selling. And the large uh, wholesalers and retailers who are selling imported produce Sell uh, less expensive, so it does not a, a good uh, opportunity for the smallholder farmers. They do not have any partnership with groups. They do not uh, belong to networks, and opportunities are not available for them. And the uh, instability of the prices is also a big challenge. We are uh, monitoring the prices in the market and we see that there is a instability. So uh, due to the, to the supply and demand mechanism, they do not uh, really control the, the price mechanism. And access to land for mainly for women is a problem and access to credit is also a problem. And working with uh, small holder farmers to access a market is a, a program uh, within the WFP uh, country uh, strategy plan. And as we are working together with the food bank, uh, the food bank is becoming one of these 
a market market assets. So food bank it buys but also sells the members of the food bank and we are going to see this. So based on this program we called a purchase for um, progress experience by uh, WP uh, and based also on our integrated resilience program, WFP Madagascar designed a smallholder farmers agricultural market support for two types of smallholder farmers, those who just have a potential of surplus and those who have an effective moderate surplus in this to be able to build an environment, uh, an enable, enabling environment. So uh, we work with farmers, individual farmers, and we work with the aggregators that we call unions, is a federation of farmers or uh, farmers organizations, a big federation. And the third part of this, um, <clears throat> pathway is the buyers, the buyers including WIP, including the Ministry of Education for the homegrown school meals, and including the food bank of Madagascar. And the fourth um, one is the market system, that means all the strategies, policies, and the government is building. Women empowerment is one of these resilience program uh, with women groups who are um, cultivating, processing, and uh, selling. And they are working mainly on cassava and transforming it, it into gari. And they are working on cactus because cactus is very available and they are working on it, transforming it, it into juice and jam, etc. And the, it is an opportunity because there is a lot of loss when uh, harvesting this cassava. But uh, in, instead of losing all this product, they are transforming it, it, it into gari or other thing or tapioca so that it can last for about two years. How does a Madagascar Food Bank work with these smallholder farmers? The food bank promotes access to market and the value chain linking the farmers, the individual ones, and to the food processors to market through the surplus they are capturing. This allows small Holder farmers to increase their income because they sell it and then they get money to send their children to school, to, to build their house, etc. So they sell the overall production to the, to the bank. And through this, uh, we are trying to professionalize these farmers. Those, there is a a component of capacity building and the food storage in the food bank. Since we have a, a warehouse, a, a individual farmers can bring their products. When do they, do, they are not able to conserve it, they can bring it to the, to the bank, to the warehouse, in order to reduce the post-harvest loss. And part of this stored product is saved to the most vulnerable people. Uh, they can sell it at reduced price or they can give the, the SS product also, or we can buy it from them for the most vulnerable population. Uh, they work also together on productivity and quality increase because the quality is also a, a challenge and it is an, an obligation to have quality product. So, and they are working together on it. And the food loan during, during the lean season, season 
uh, in the lean season, they have difficulties. So the product that has been stored in the warehouse can be uh, loaned to people who are in the in the need and uh, or given it to the most vulnerable people. Three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah. And we can sum up this saying that we have four level in this uh, four pathway, the individual farmers, the aggregators, the buyers, and the market system. What are we expecting doing all these things is to build a sustainable food system, including the market system, the demand, and the, the supply. Reduce the, uh, the, the reduce the post harvest loss, uh, build governance and gender equality, financial assets, and uh, build capacity to generate marketable surplus. So, um, as shown in this picture, um, the food bank is uh, there's a link with the smallholder farmers first. Uh, the farmers can sell their products in the bank. Uh, at the parallel, they can have a store processing cost harvest loss by uh, making their products in, a, in, in the store of the bank. And at the lean season, uh, our small other farmers can borrow uh, food from um, the bank for their own uh, consum consumption. And uh, the link with um, our partner, like Sodexo, for example, that uh, uh, Sodexo found effectively the bank, but uh, not only the bank, uh, Sodexo give the a support to the, our small older farmers by giving them uh, uh, capacity strengthening in management, leadership, and increase their, their uh, how to say that, their, um, the way to uh, to increase the productivity uh, and uh, there way there are a free uh, a real uh, partnership between the partner the smallholder farmers and the bank and uh, our next steps in just, just a few words on our next steps and uh, it's clear that in madagascar the strategy is to build resilience is to give uh, food to those who are in need, but also how to build this resilience with them. So uh, we increase additional assistance to very poor households during the lead period, okay, but at the same time, how to build this resilience that uh, give them um, ownership, increase the impact of this food bank, more beneficiaries, more food, capacity resilience and better resilience, as I said. The last, maybe, uh, I have already talked about it, the professionalization of the smallholder farmers by giving them the opportunity to increase production and improve really the quality. And uh, Brandine, I've already talked about it before, to set up these solidarity grocery stores in urban areas by replicating our model in, uh, in Tanandav in a rural area to suburban area here in Antananarivo. And how to strengthen the non-supported uh, schools by WFP, by the food bank. So where WFP is not uh, available, food bank will be there. And food bank su support, uh, supported countries also, how to link them to the smallholder farmers and the food bank. Uh, and then we would really want to build a food bank in Antananarivo, the capital of Madagascar. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's a very detailed and very useful presentation. Thank you. Um, just because of time, we will actually hold questions there again we've got one more presentation and then we'll go into breakout groups and in your groups you'll have an opportunity again to ask someone from food bank madagascar questions on there uh, but thank you again for that excellent presentation 
So for our final presentation, we are going to switch to South Africa. I'm talking still in the general agriculture space, but particularly serving people in those rural areas as well. So we're going to hand over to Andy from Food Forward South Africa. So I had made 20 minutes of this, and then after Andy, we will switch into our breakout group. So Andy, over to you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will share my screen right now and see if you guys can see that and that. There we go. Okay. Um, oops. There we go. Uh, can you guys all see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so uh, 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 my presentation will focus on our mobile rural depots, not so much on our second harvest initiative, which is um, our work with farmers. But I will touch on, 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 on that throughout the presentation. Um, so here we go. Um, so South Africa food security is growing quite rapidly. We have a total population of 57 million people and roughly 50% are likely to be food poor by the end of 2020. Food Forward SA's vision is a South Africa without hunger. Um, but our food banking model was mostly an urban based solution to address hunger, given our proximity to the actors within the food supply chain. Um, and this resulted in an inequitable access uh, to food for those living in vulnerable rural communities because of the large distances to access food from our warehouses. Just so you are aware, um, in, in, in our model, in our urban centers, uh, beneficial organizations come to our organization to fetch their food uh, 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 daily uh, by, by a schedule. And with our mobile rural depots, uh, we take food uh, to, to the rural communities. So to change this urban bias, we set up what was called mobile rural depots, and that was July 2019. So we're about a year into our expansion with regard to mobile rural depots, uh, and uh, we received seed funding, not finding, seed funding from GFN uh, for this project, which allowed us to be able to do this. Our mobile rural depots are simple and cost effective to implement how it works. So firstly, we identify and select the most vulnerable rural communities in each province and focusing on areas that are far from our warehouses that have high levels of stunting, which is a malnutrition related disease, poverty, unemployment, and where there's a huge lack of access to food. What we then do is we find central locations taking into account where our existing beneficiary organizations are. We choose the most central location for a meeting point, which will invariably be uh, the venue of one of our beneficiary organizations who kindly accommodate us for uh, the time we need to drop food off. Um, we have an info session um, uh, when we do the first launch uh, with existing beneficiary organizations that we're delivering food to at the central locations. And then we agree on a time and a place to meet um, that all, everyone is satisfied um, because some have to travel further than others in, in this model. Um, and then the food distribution. The first meeting is also the first time that BOs get food delivered by Food Forward SA. And we also use the opportunity pro to provide them with information and get feedback from them. So it's a nice opportunity to network with our stakeholders this is typically what uh, uh, the depot will provide. Um, um, this is how food comes. Uh, there's a pallet for each organization of food, and there's usually a large variety of that food. And this is essentially how the process works. So each of our mobile rural depots gets food every single month, and uh, we take the food to them. So our warehouses, pre-packed pallets, uh, per, for every beneficiary organization. And the day of the delivery, um, the POs check their POD. So all the documentation is already printed at the warehouse before before we leave the warehouse. Um, and 
uh, uh, the beneficiary organizations check the documentation. Um, uh, 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 so they check the paperwork and make sure it corresponds with the actual food that they receive, and then they sign that documentation. On the way back, though, um, where, where it's possible, we collect food uh, uh, surplus produce from farmers that are in the nearby areas um, because we try and uh, 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 develop relationships with farmers um, as part of our second harvest program. Some of our trips are day trips, so you leave the morning, you come back the evening, and other trips are over two days because of the distances. Some useful info about the MRDs. First of all, they are very cost effective. Uh, because we own our own logistics infrastructure, the only cost is fuel and accommodation. Um, it allows us to increase our reach because once we started MRD, within six months, the number of beneficiary organization and people served doubles. They, they grow rapidly. Um, there's seamless integration because we can more efficiently run our other programs like Second Harvest, as well as Foodshare, which is our digital platform. Um, and it allows for increased access to food because vulnerable communities in rural areas are worse off than our urban counterparts. So people like uh, vulnerable groups like the aged, vulnerable children and women are the ones that we target through this model and they get better access to food and our MRDs help us achieve this. Is another example of a, a, a launch at one of our mobile rural depots. The one in East London, which is in the Eastern Cape. It's about four hours away from where our warehouse is. So one year later, uh, we have uh, eight mobile rural depots across four provinces. Um, and those eight serve uh, 94 beneficiary organizations reaching 48,000, nearly 50,000 people. What's very encouraging is that this total represents roughly 10% of our total bio population and 12% of our beneficiaries. We aim to open a further four MRDs by the end of the financial year. We've already scheduled uh, the next two. One will be in September, one in October, another one in November, and um, uh, we'll end of the financial year with, with 12. To sustain the growth of the MRDs, we are expanding our second harvest initiative, which is our outreach program with uh, commercial farmers, as well as food share, um, which is our digital platform to be able to underpin and support the growth of this model. Uh, we have also kindly received a fuel sponsorship from NGEN, um, and uh, which will likely be annual. So, so there's very, very little costs to us to be able to run this program. As we grow, the demand on our logistics infrastructure will increase. We're already seeing that happening in the Western Cape and in the Eastern Cape. And we are already talking with third party logistics partners for the loan of their vehicles for uh, one or two days a month. And that, that helps us because then we don't have to buy a whole fleet of vehicles to be able to support the program. That's it. I'm gonna unshare my screen. Andy, thank you. I can tell you've done that before. You <laughs> polished presentation, and we got through that quickly. Um, also, I'm sure this has been said before that there, there is only one Andy, um, and so when we go into our breakout groups, um, only one group will be lucky enough to have someone from Food Forward South Africa. So with that in mind, why don't we just take a couple of minutes if anybody does have questions specifically for Andy. Sorry, Michael. Yes, I do have um, um, uh, a question for him. So, okay, quite a number of, but I think I'll just put this together. So I think um, uh, my question for you is, um, the, the model that you just explained now, I'm, I'm trying to see the relationship between our, um, uh, the, between that model and your partner agencies. Like, um, it, it, it seems like you still use pa your partner agencies and you still serve uh, people directly. I'm just trying to see how um, the relationship between this particular model, and I know you have quite a number of partner agencies you are working with. So what's the, do they, are they separate programs or are they related? Because I'm still trying to understand their relationship. 
or otherwise. Uh, so, so, so this one is uh, a uh, different program in that the difference is, although we have a total of just over a thousand beneficiary organizations in, 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 in its entirety, um, most of our beneficiary organizations are urban based and they are able to come and fetch food from our warehouses, which are also in urban areas. So it's easier for them to access food uh, from our warehouses. But the rural communities, some are four hours away. Because they don't, they have limited financial resources, it's way too expensive for them to come and fetch food from our warehouses and take it back. So the only difference between the, the, the program, of, they, they still fall under our same umbrella, but in this program, we take food to those rural communities. Um, uh, so that so that they can so that they can have access to food. Otherwise, without this program, they would not be able to have access. To food. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It's clear. It's clearer now. Thank you. I'll do one final question before we go into the group. So, Blond Blondine. Thank you, Andy. And I understand that you. You make a, a sort of survey uh, by getting information from the organizations. And what do you, what uh, type of feedback do you get? Can you uh, tell us something about it? And do the organization participate to the uh, to, to the fees in a certain manner? I don't know. But for the sustainability, I would like to know if they do participate. And if you can um, tell us more about your digital platform. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Blandine. Um, so let's start uh, with the feedback. Let's start with the feedback from beneficiary organizations. So, um, I, was, I was actually present at the first six mobile rural depots we opened across the country. And I, I have to say the, the gratitude from people in rural communities, knowing that there is a sustained inflow of food into their organizations. So we, we focus on organizations that take care of vulnerable children, abused women, um, aged care groups, and youth at risk. Um, and, and I must say that, you know, when we opened up our, our Southern Cape along the West Coast mobile rural depot, you know, when I engaged with the people afterwards, um, two, two beneficiary organizations uh, uh, heads uh, came to me and they were, they were in tears. They couldn't believe, firstly, that we are going to support them with food every single month. And secondly, they were blown away by the quality of the food. They did not expect um, that we would give them uh, that the kind of quality of, of the food they had expected. So it's most welcome. And, and the, the, the growth of our program of the mobile rural depots speaks for itself because wherever we start the mobile rural depot, we start usually with four or five organizations. Within six months, we've got 10, 15, 20 organizations and we require larger vehicles. So it's a much needed program because uh, vulnerable rural communities have less access and opportunities to food. Um, um, so so it, it, it's, it's really welcome. The second thing around fees, our beneficiary organizations don't pay a cent additional for this program, in spite of the fact that we go drive for a huge amount of hours to them. They pay the same nominal fee as organizations in urban areas, um, and that's dependent on the size of the organization. So each of our organizations do pay a, a membership fee, a monthly membership fee, but it, whether you're urban or rural, you pay, you pay the same fee. I won't, for the sake of time, touch on our digital platform, FoodShare, but you're more than welcome to get information from Gabby, or you can email me directly, and I will share that with you, because that's not part of the scope of my, of my presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Um, I believe you very kindly did a uh, presentation on your digital platform at FBLI, last year or the year before. So if we can find those slides, we can make those available to this group if that's okay with you. Thank you. And I think uh, what this has covered, just my own summing up through the whole, so nearly two hours we've been together now, is there's very clear 
benef potential benefits to working with the agricultural sector. You can open up whole new service areas, including people that you aren't currently serving. Access to quite a high volume of very valuable, nutritious product. Um, but there are some challenges to doing it, which vary from food bank to food bank, but often include sheer distances involved. Um, going Lagos, just getting beyond Lagos State can take you a very long time. Um, the infrastructure capacity that, that you need in terms of vehicles, um, in terms of potentially cold chain, as in refrigerated vehicles and storage, uh, staff power, uh, volunteers, which is even more of a struggle at the moment in COVID. So convincing that first farmer to start giving you product, even if you are offering something in return, and then the word of mouth spreads. Um, and the seasonality and being flexible of what crops may be available at any time. So I think there are, of course, challenges, but plenty of upside. Um, for those who are doing it, I hope you'll look to expand and continually improve your programs. For those that aren't yet working with the agricultural sector, something to think about in your strategic plan and tactical plans as you expand your operations and as you think about your food sourcing strategy, that additional sector of the supply chain. So I just want to say again, thank you to all of you for a fantastic session today. Um, thank you for humoring us while we experimented with breakout rooms and a different format. I think the conversation I saw was, was really engaged. So thank you for, for all of you for making this a successful session. Um, please keep the conversation going as well. We, we have a platform called Workplace. In our follow-up email later today, we will include a link to invite you to join the Workplace tool. Some of you that were in Cape Town last year will, will remember that. Um, this is really Facebook but for your work. And we, that's a great platform. It doesn't cost you anything. It's a great platform for you all to keep in touch with each other. If you didn't get a chance to ask Madagascar that question or to ask Kenya that question, follow up with them through, through Workplace and, and your other peers in this group. Um, I would particularly like to thank our excellent case study presenters. Uh, Susan from Food Bank in Kenya, Blondine and Asia from Food Bank Madagascar, and Andy from Food Forward South Africa. Thank you for the time in both today and the rehearsal, but also the, the PowerPoint presentations you put together. Again, we'll send out the link to all of those later, um, but those are really useful assets for everybody to have. So thank you very much. Uh, I must also thank our FBLI sponsors, General Mills, HEB, Brambles, Cargill, DLA Piper Foundation, Fundacion Lala, and Ingredion. And in the email we send out later, as well as the links, we will also send you uh, a link to a quick survey. It's literally only two minutes to fill that in. We really, really do appreciate you taking the time. It helps us shape these sessions for you. And then just really the last thing to know is two upcoming virtual FBLI sessions to mark in your calendar. First one is next week, 9th of September. We have a keynote session, global session, by a gentleman called Raj Kumar, who will talk about how international development is evolving and changing. I think that could be interesting for everybody in this group. You can register for that on the website. And then on the 22nd of September is the next follow-up for this Africa cohort, where we will be holding a workshop on sourcing, um, and particularly looking at how do you position yourselves, how do you develop materials to attract donations of product from corporations. And I'm very happy to say we will have a guest speaker in that session from ShopRite Checkers. A lot of you will be familiar with ShopRite, major retail supermarket chain in Africa, based in uh, South Africa, of course, and a great partner of Food Forward. And our thanks to Andy for helping secure that speaker. So that's the 22nd of September. We will send out an invitation in detail soon for that one. 
But otherwise, thank you again today for, for today and for all the incredible work you are doing in your home countries. We will just leave this Zoom call open for a few minutes. So if any of you want to chat to each other, please feel free. But otherwise, we will, we will leave you to it. Thank you again. Take care and go well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.